Good morning, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Jason Bordoff. I'm the co-founding dean of the Columbia Climate School and the founding director of the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia. And I'm pleased to welcome you to today's discussion on how we achieve zero carbon hydrogen in a circular economy. Um, scenarios for net zero 2050, including those recently by the IEA in its landmark report, find significant volumes of hydrogen and other zero carbon synthetic fuels may be needed to achieve these goals of deep decarbonization. Uh, hydrogen is key for decarbonizing hard to electrify sectors, for example, burns at high temperature, which makes it attractive for removing some dirtier fuels from industry, uh, from parts of transport, uh, among other sectors. And it burns clean, meaning it releases no CO2 um, when it combusts. At the same time, there are a set of challenges associated with hydrogen, green and, and, and blue, that need to be addressed to ensure we get it right. And that if we start to invest more in hydrogen production and hydrogen infrastructure, that technology delivers the climate benefits that it promises to and that we must see to get to our climate goals. Just switching to hydrogen will not by itself decarbonize these sectors. We need to pay attention to how we produce it, how we transport it. Most hydrogen we use today is produced uh, from fossil fuels, including coal and natural gas, meaning there are carbon emissions associated with its production that need to be addressed. So for effective decarbonization, we need to produce it in a way that does not add to our carbon budget, meaning via zero emission power sources or with carbon capture, storage, use and sequestration. Because only by developing a zero emission supply chain can we really take advantage of this as a carbon free fuel. Here at the Center on Global Energy Policy, we're exploring options for how to scale uh, zero carbon hydrogen through the carbon management research initiative led by my colleague and friend, Dr. Julio Friedman. We have in collaboration with the Global CCS Institute delivered a series of fact sheets on the production, transportation, use uh, of hydrogen as, um, as a zero carbon fuel and, and, and uh, appreciate the, the collaboration with them uh, on, on those fact sheets and that information. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, the moderator of today's event, uh, my friend, Adam Siminski. He is senior advisor to the Board of Trustees and the former president of CAPSARC, the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center in Riyadh. Also served uh, for many years, several years, about four years, I think, as the head of EIA, the Energy Information Administration at the US Department of Energy. And I can think of no one better to guide today's conversation that, uh, than Adam. And I'm grateful to Adam for, for you for being here. So let me turn the conversation to you. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Adam, please take it away. Uh, Jason, uh, thanks very much for those introductory remarks and the very kind introduction uh, as well. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me quickly say that this event is being webcast live and the full video will be available online in coming days and it is open uh, to the press. Uh, for those of you joining us via Zoom, you can submit questions uh, for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen and, uh, and we'll see that there and try to, to uh, work that in. Uh, we'll begin uh, today with video remarks from our keynote speaker, uh, Halad Belief, who's the chief negotiator for climate agreements for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Let me just very quickly mention a little bit about Halad's background. He's got over 30 years of experience in sustainability, climate change policy, and carbon management. As I mentioned, he is uh, a uh, lead negotiator for Saudi Arabia on climate agreements, and he's a senior climate advisor to the uh, Saudi Arabia's Minister of Energy. Uh, Halid serves as the kingdom's focal point for uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, and the Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change, the IPCC. Uh, uh, Julio, could you run the video, please? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start with thanking the organizers for this event and the invitation to speak. Addressing the challenge of climate change opens uh, many opportunities for various approaches. The circular carbon economy, I'm gonna refer to it as CCE throughout this uh, statement is a major approach that leads the path to resiliency. The CCE 
where it's four R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove, brings to the forefront emission removal as one of the major, if not the major, uh, lever uh, of immediate climate action. Emission removal encompasses many technologies that open uh, uh, complementary opportunities for technology development, scaling up and deployments also. Zero carbon, hydrogen uh, is one of those technologies. The circular carbon economy has recently been championed by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, in the year 2020, uh, during the presidency of Saudi Arabia uh, for the G20. Leaders has already endorsed the CCE as a pragmatic and a comprehensive solution to address climate change. This achievement came during one of the most difficult times in the last 100 years, the year that COVID-19 pandemic disturbed life as we know it. Elements of the CCE have long been in employed in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia prior to the formal development of the CCE. Saudi Arabia has been uh, a champion in this arena. Our history goes back uh, to the 1950s when the government of Saudi Arabia required Aramco to stop flaring gas and instead re-inject it to maintain pressure in oil reservoirs. This is a clear example of a national awareness and acting uh, upon it. In the 1970s, the government of Saudi Arabia sponsored the Master Gas Plan. This system was uh, implemented by Saudi Aramco, coming into operation in early 1980s. This system, which is the best sustainability examples on the global stage, uh, the system has been responsible for preventing significant emissions from being emitted uh, to the atmosphere annually from uh, Saudi Arabia. Building on the CCE approach, Saudi Arabia developed and implemented technological and operational plans that resulted in the first global shipment of carbon neutral blue ammonia to Japan during one of the most trying years in recent history, proving the kingdom's commitment to its leadership position of providing solutions to the climate challenges. This ammonia shipment is one of the leading global examples that will continue to be cited during sustainability and CCE events, uh, in, including discussions and workshops similar to those current ones that we have today, which is an, a well-deserving citation given its historical uh, place. This shipment would not have been possible without the emphasis that the kingdom places on technology development to address the climate change uh, presented by uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Carbon neutral ammonia is used as a zero uh, carbon hydrogen energy source for zero carbon power generation in Japan. Uh, many lessons can be noted uh, from this first of a kind shipment. One of the first lessons that we can uh, uh, distill from this is the value of keeping our eyes on the, on the prize. That is avoiding being distracted by uh, chatter surrounding sources and focusing on ensuring that the world continues to be energized, while also advancing technological solutions that address the challenge itself. In this case, it's the greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to global warming. The second lesson that we could cite out of this is translation of commitment of the government of Saudi Arabia into action. As I have elaborated earlier, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has long-standing history of leading climate solutions uh, in this regard. To rephrase what has been reiterated on many occasions by His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, the Minister of Energy, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will not only be part of the solution, but we're really looking forward uh, to lead the solutions. This is a commitment at the highest level that leads us uh, to the third lesson to be cited here, which is government commitment can lead to facilitating collaboration within the country 
as well as outside the country. Allow me to elaborate. Many challenges related to carbon neutral ammonia and in turn to the zero carbon hydrogen were uh, identified in the global uh, uh, stage. The kingdom faced uh, these challenges with the determination to create a solution. The solution covered the entire supply chain, thus demonstrating that technological development is what is needed to meet the climate challenge. The 2020 carbon neutral ammonia shipment from Saudi Arabia to Japan demonstrated a closed loop solution that resulted from a championship of our government, which facilitated collaboration between Saudi Aramco and SABIC to produce the ammonia while using the capture CO2 to, for producing chemicals and the enhanced uh, oil recovery. This domestic collaboration was joined with collaboration with the Japanese partners, the Institute of, of, of Energy Economics in Japan, IEEJ, and the Japanese uh, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, MITI. I will conclude my remarks by highlighting that technology is the key solution to addressing the, and overcoming the uh, harmful effects of all greenhouse gases, irrespective of their sources. Climate response to the climate uh, change issue and the emissions, uh, uh, in particular, uh, rely on uh, managing those emissions and finding ways and means uh, to remove them, uh, and not on the sources that they come from. Embracing the circular carbon economy framework as adopted by the G20 offers the global economy unparalleled opportunities to flourish and allow us uh, collectively to grow without harm uh, to developing uh, economies. Looking into the future, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has put forward plans uh, to build the world's largest green hydrogen project in an unparalleled uh, new mega city of Neo. When completed, this project in Yom will produce 650 tons of green hydrogen daily, which is calculated to be sufficient to drive around 20,000 hydrogen uh, fuel buses. The global uh, markets will receive the hydrogen fuel from this facility as ammonia, which will then be converted back to hydrogen at the end markets. This new facility is expected to start production in 2025. By the way, this will not stop here, but the Kingdom has also great ambitions to generate blue hydrogen and lead the clean hydrogen future. Let's work together and ensure a future of energy access to all while ensuring that we employ technology to protect our planet. I wish you a successful event and fruitful discussion. Thank you. I'd uh, like to thank uh, Holland very much for those remarks and uh, just to underscore uh, the points that he made about hydrogen. Uh, there are a number of uh, technology uh, projects that I think uh, you'll be hearing more about uh, from the kingdom in the future, including uh, a number of activities in the carbon uh, capture uh, utilization and storage area, uh, as well as uh, looking at metrics and standards that will be needed uh, to really move in this direction. Uh, I'd now like to welcome uh, Julio Friedman, a senior research scholar uh, at uh, Columbia, and Alex Zapanthus, a general manager at the uh, Global CCS Institute. Uh, very quickly on these two extremely talented individuals, uh, Julio is uh, one of the most widely known uh, and authoritative experts in the United States on carbon uh, removal uh, including CO2 drawdown from the air and oceans, uh, CO2 conversion and use, carbon to value, and uh, hydrogen industrial decarbonization, and so much more. Uh, at the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, Julio was responsible for DOE's R&D program and advanced fossil energy systems and CCUS. Uh, Alex Zapantis uh, joined the Global CCS Institute uh, some time ago and is now accountable for managing the Institute's consultancy services. He's got 15 years of continuous experience working on issues related to climate change and CCS. His expertise is focused on energy and climate change policy, carbon capture and storage, 
uh, climate strategy, uh, development and risk analysis, and a number of things involving industry and government engagement and public policy uh, regulation. So uh, Julio, uh, over to uh, you and uh, Alex, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Adam. Uh, and thank you to both the Center and the Global Institute for pulling this event together. Um, uh, let's get into it. There's so much to do and discuss. Let's hold on a second. Everybody see this okay? Marvelous. This is part of a series that we are doing together, the Global Institute and Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy around a circular carbon economy. Uh, we encourage you to look at the other reports in the series. Uh, you can do so at our respective homes, as well as at our dedicated website. Uh, as uh, Adam and Jason and Khaled have all said, we're on the clock and the next 10 years are decisive. We simply must get very deep reductions in order to hit a one and a half degree target, uh, the UN suggests that we need something on the order of a 50% reduction in the next 10 years. Uh, that is equivalent to about 25 gigatons of greenhouse gas abatement. It's a really big number. So uh, we can curse the darkness or light a candle. The real question is what should we do? Uh, uh, among the things you can do are reduce greenhouse gas emissions through things like efficiency or substitution with zero carbon fuels. Uh, we can reuse carbon dioxide, that's without chemically altering it for some value. We can recycle it, building it into chemical products like fertilizer or using it as energy or making plastics, or you can just remove it. Uh, you can remove it from the point source of creation, uh, for example, capturing from a steel mill or a power plant, or you can remove it from the air and oceans using a combination of natural or technology approaches. Uh, this is the full roster. These are the only sets of things you can do to get to net zero. Reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove emissions. And hydrogen has a big role to play in uh, reduce, recycle, and remove. Uh, that's today's conversation. So you might wonder where does all this hydrogen come from? Today we make about 70 million tons of hydrogen in a pure form around the world. Uh, we make about 100 million tons of it if you include what's in syngas, uh, and almost all of that is from fossil fuels. It's about 95% plus of all of the hydrogen in the world is made this way. And in point of fact, uh, that emits about a half a billion tons of CO2. That's typically called gray hydrogen. Uh, now, you don't have to emit that CO2. You can capture that CO2 and permanently store it in geological formations. Uh, this is generally referred to as blue hydrogen. Uh, you can also not use fossil fuels at all. You can just go straight to water and electrolyze it using zero carbon electricity of all kinds or any kind. And if you do that, you can make a low carbon footprint hydrogen as well. Beyond blue and green, you can also use wastes like municipal solid wastes or agricultural wastes. And you can convert that to hydrogen in the same way that you might fossil fuels uh, this is called biohydrogen. Uh, if you do that uh, with wastes, the lifetime footprint is near zero. Uh, if you want, you can also capture and store that CO2 and make this climate restorative and uh, pull CO2 from the air and oceans through this process. Um, even though today's headline uh, for the event is zero carbon hydrogen, uh, blue hydrogen and green hydrogen can be very low hydrogen but they have to be built that way and run that way. And they're not quite zero. There's some small life cycle footprints associated with them even then. Uh, this represents those numbers. Clean hydrogen can come from all of these things and the life cycle very much depends on the inputs. Uh, so uh, this is from uh, the blue hydrogen report uh, that Alex and the Global Institute published earlier this year. Um, this is carbon intensity, kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. And from methane, you're talking eight or nine kilograms. From coal, you're talking more like 22 kilograms. But if you capture that, you can get very low footprints, below two kilograms uh, of hydrogen per kilogram of CO2. If you use uh, zero carbon electricity, your scope one emissions are zero, but your life cycle emissions are below one. So very, very low footprints. And then again, using biomass, 
you can start at zero and go carbon negative, carbon restorative beyond that. Uh, the technologies to do all of these things are pretty mature. Uh, we have a lot of technologies for blue hydrogen. And in fact, there are units fielded today. Alex will talk about that in a minute. Uh, same thing for green hydrogen and the number of units fielded are growing rapidly uh, using a combination of PEM electrolyzers and alkali electrolyzers. Um, and that said, there are certainly ways to improve on this technology. There's a large, rich innovation uh, agenda to pursue that would further reduce costs and improve performance for all of these technologies. Uh, as Jason mentioned at the top, uh, we do need zero carbon fuels uh, uh, that are made from hydrogen to power a number of things, shipping in particular. Uh, but the zero carbon fuels can also substitute for fossil fuels in industrial processes or uh, in power plants. Uh, there's three options basically, liquid hydrogen, ammonia, and zero carbon methanol. Zero carbon methanol would be made with recycled CO2. Um, and we have a sense of what these things will cost. Uh, and we have a sense for how they'll be used. Uh, we see all of them as being potentially important in different applications. Ammonia looks particularly good as something to send around the world, to use in ships and to serve as a ballast for trade something like LNG today. Um, it is also the case that if you use these fuels without combustion, if you go straight into a fuel cell instead, you basically double the efficiency of a conventional combustion engine and you get much stronger health benefits. No socks, no NOx, no particulates because there's no combustion. Uh, and that has substantial implications uh, with respect to equity and justice and opportunities to improve uh, the environment broadly, as well as greenhouse gas emissions. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex to talk about his work on blue hydrogen. Thank you very much, uh, Julio. Um, so hydrogen can be used across a very broad range of industries and applications, displacing fossil fuels. Now, these include industrial processes as a source of heat or as a reductant, um, to fuel cells or gas turbines, where they can be used to generate power, to generate, uh, sorry, to power vehicles or to, uh, or to feed the grid. The Hydrogen Council estimates that demand for hydrogen could be as high as 530 million tonnes per annum by the year 2050, delivering up to 6 billion tonnes of abatement uh, in that year. Of course, that estimate is subject to many assumptions about the demand for hydrogen, the energy sources that the hydrogen would displace. However, it illustrates the potential of clean hydrogen to support multi gigaton scale abatement across the global economy. So that's the size of the prize that, uh, that we're chasing with, with clean hydrogen. Next slide, please, uh, Julio. It's useful to consider uh, where we are now and where we need to get to by the year 2050. So today around 120 million tonnes of hydrogen is produced annually, a mixture of pure hydrogen and hydrogen in syngas. And about 98% of hydrogen is produced by coal gasification or steam methane reformation. The remaining 2% is produced by electrolysis, mostly as a byproduct of chlorine and caustic soda production, which is actually a very emissions intense process. Only 0.3% of hydrogen is, is produced using uh, renewable energy powered electrolyzers today. And only about 0.4% of hydrogen is produced using fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. So this means that about 99% of hydrogen production today is emissions intense, emitting about 830 million tonnes per annum of carbon dioxide. So this means that we need to increase the production of clean hydrogen from less than about 1 million tonnes per annum today to around 500 million tonnes per annum in less than 30 years. So rapid scale up of production of clean hydrogen is absolutely critical to delivering this abatement opportunity. Of course, this rapid scale up in production uh, must also be met by an equally rapid scale up in demand for clean hydrogen. So price is also a critical factor, uh, but we'll talk more on that a bit later. Next slide, please, Julio. The blue hydrogen is well positioned to kickstart that rapid scale up because it's available, uh, it's mature, and it's been operating at meaningful scale uh, quite literally for decades. This table shows the seven operating uh, commercial hydrogen production plants with carbon capture and storage, uh, plus another one that's currently in construction. The Enid fertilizer plant has been producing hydrogen with CCS since 1982. And these are large facilities with the capacity to produce between 100 and 1,300 tonnes per day of hydrogen 
So large scale clean hydrogen production with CCS is actually very well established from an engineering and technical perspective. Renewable hydrogen production is also advancing, but just from a much smaller base. The world's largest renewable hydrogen plant, which is currently operating today, is in Fukushima uh, in Japan. It has 10 megawatts of electrolyzers powered by a 20 megawatt solar PV array. And assuming, of course, that there was sufficient battery storage to store the excess power produced by the array for later use by the electrolyzers, it would have the capacity to produce more than two tonnes of clean hydrogen per day. New and larger renewable hydrogen projects are emerging. Two very significant examples are listed here. The NEON project uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Asian Renewable Energy Hub uh, in Australia's remote northwest. Both of these uh, enjoy excellent wind and solar resources and access to large areas of land at very low cost. So these are both very exciting projects. Uh, and later in the presentation, Julio will talk a lot more uh, about the opportunity of, uh, of green hydrogen. Uh, next slide, please, Julio. I mentioned previously that the cost of hydrogen production is critical to ensure that it's competitive with conventional alternatives so that demand for clean hydrogen uh, can reach the 500 million tonnes per annum in the next 30 years. This chart shows estimates of the cost of production of clean hydrogen published over the last couple of years uh, by four credible organisations, Australia's uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, the International Energy Agency, the International Renewable Energy Agency uh, and the Hydrogen Council. Note that the underlying assumptions for these estimates, for example, capacity factors, fuel costs vary, so they're not actually strictly directly comparable. However, it's pretty clear that there is generally good agreement on the cost of fossil fuel production pathways with CCS. This is because fossil production of hydrogen with CCS is decades old and current costs are very well understood. There is a far greater variability within these four studies uh, in the cost of production for renewable hydrogen due mainly to variations in the assumed capacity factors of the renewable power generation, which impact the price of electricity and the capacity factor of the electrolyzers. These are generic studies, of course, and the actual cost of production in any location will always be site specific, but it's clear that clean hydrogen produced by a steam methane reformation or coal gasification with CCS is currently the lowest cost clean hydrogen production pathway in most locations. Uh, next slide, please, Julio. Another critical success factor is uh, whether or not production is constrained uh, at the necessary scale. So these charts compare the primary resources required to produce 1.76 million tonnes of blue or green hydrogen. I chose that figure because it's the annual production of the proposed array project in, in Northern Australia. All three of these production pathways have similar water requirements. The fossil pathways obviously require coal or gas, but these amounts are small compared to the resources that are available. For example, about six and a half million tonnes of methane would be required. Uh, this, this compares to almost 80 million tonnes of LNG exported by Australia alone last year. The significant di differenti differentiating factors between blue and green hydrogen are the requirements for electricity and land. The Array project will use 97 terawatt hours of electricity generated by renewable generation covering 5,750 square kilometres of land. To produce the same quantity of clean hydrogen from gas or coal with CCS would require between three and seven terawatt hours of power and perhaps as much as 17 square kilometres of land if there was a 500 kilometre long pipeline to transport the CO2 to the injection site. So the availability of these resources, coal, gas, water, renewable energy uh, and land will determine which option is the best in any location. In some locations it'll be blue, in other locations it'll be green. Uh, next slide please, Julio. Of course, there is one additional primary resource that I uh, haven't mentioned, and that is pore space for the geological storage of carbon dioxide uh, required by the production of blue hydrogen. So the chart on the left shows the amount of carbon dioxide requiring permanent geological storage in millions of tonnes from the production of 1.76 million tonnes of blue hydrogen, coal or gas. The map on the right shows the estimated global carbon dioxide geological storage capacity in billions of tonnes of carbon dioxide. Global CO2 storage capacity is more than sufficient for carbon capture and storage to play its full role under any emissions abatement scenario, and that is for all applications of CCS in all industries, including hydrogen production. But considering just hydrogen production, if one considers an extreme hypothetical case where all 530 million tonnes of clean hydrogen is blue, the annual storage requirement would be about 7.6 billion tonnes. This compares to a global storage capacity measured in thousands of billions of, of tonnes. So the geological storage capacity is not a constraint. 
Next slide, please, Julio. Finally, consider the opposite extreme hypothetical case where all 530 million tonnes of clean hydrogen is green. That would, would require around 29,000 terawatt hours of renewable or nuclear electricity, which is more than the total global electricity generation in 2018 from all sources. That quantity of near zero emissions electricity, if dispatchable, could theoretically completely replace all fossil generation capacity resulting in a global zero emissions power system. This raises the obvious question as to whether green hydrogen production is the best use of enormous amounts of low emissions energy. So this chart compares the emissions abatement achieved by using renewable electricity to produce hydrogen, which then displaces the combustion of natural gas to the emissions abatement achieved if that same quantity of renewable electricity is fed directly into a power grid displacing fossil generation. It shows that three times as much abatement is delivered if the renewable electricity is used directly as electricity to displace natural gas combined cycle generation, and over eight times as much abatement is delivered if it displaces, for example, German lignite power generation. Of course, there will be situations where, like NEOM and ARE, uh, where there are fantastic renewable energy resources and no opportunity to use that energy in an established power grid. But whenever there is a significant power grid nearby that includes fossil generation, renewable electricity should be used there first rather than to produce hydrogen because that will deliver far greater emissions abatement. And over to you now, Julio, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, moving on, uh, green hydrogen is extremely promising. Uh, we are big fans of it here. Uh, and the cost and the carbon footprint associated with its production vary quite a lot. One of the important findings of the paper released today is that it must really be zero carbon electricity going into the electrolyzer to make it zero carbon hydrogen. Um, and in point of fact, uh, different grids from around the world, even relatively clean grids like Europe, do not deliver uh, zero carbon hydrogen. Uh, you really need dedicated zero carbon electricity sources like renewables or nuclear or hydro. Uh, today, the costs associated with this are pretty high. And the reason why is because you have to have high capacity factors as well as low carbon content. Um, in different grids, uh, they are subsidized uh, in the US and in Europe, for example, to help defray a lot of those costs. The numbers which we are looking at here are the unsubsidized costs using numbers for off the shelf electrolyzers uh, and uh, dedicated low carbon electricity supplies with high capacity factors. In this case, about 90%. Um, the costs do vary and the footprint do vary in different markets. We wanted to understand that in terms of cost. So we took a set of scenarios uh, and ran them through Monte Carlo analysis, 12,000 simulations for each case, really trying to understand how the resource base, how the grid system, how innovation in renewables that would reduce cost, how innovation in electrolyzers that would reduce cost, how all of these things would propagate forward uh, in a 2030 kind of context. And what you see is the costs come down an enormous amount across all these markets in some cheaper than others, uh, in the US in 2030, our estimates are about four bucks a kilogram uh, in Europe uh, higher. You'll also see that there's a range. Some of that it reflects actually the range of resource and uh, the potential for cost reductions to come in further. Uh, other published estimates are both higher and lower than ours. So we're pleased with these results. And of course, there will be some places where the costs are on the low end today, which is where the projects are going in. It is the case that we see those costs in 2030 as still being more expensive than the low carbon fossil options. Uh, in this case, the yellow one is a blue carbon option uh, for steam methane reforming with CCS. Uh, it's worth knowing that that's probably not gonna be true anymore in 2040. In 2040 and certainly by 2050, our projections and most projections would indicate that green hydrogen would be cheaper. So in the next 20 years, we see a role for both of these fuels, but in the long haul, green hydrogen is gonna be the dominant producer of low carbon hydrogen in the system. In order to do this, we need a lot of infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure concerns are generally underrepresented these days. Uh, the ability for transmission lines, renewable power build out, electrolyzer build out, all of these are massive costs. And if we wanna get up to the kind of numbers that Alex was talking about, 
uh, or that the IEA scenarios demand. If you're gonna make half a billion tons of hydrogen in 2050, uh, just the infrastructure costs are gonna run you on the order of $14 trillion. That's just a lot of money. Um, uh, you can reduce that cost actually by doing a blend of green and blue hydrogen. And that's again, a pretty robust finding for a lot of studies. If you wanna to get to a one and a half degree scenario as opposed to a two degree scenario, which is what the IA scenarios are, uh, you can defray the total cost again by blending in a mixture of blue and green. Uh, the geography of hydrogen production is mixed around the world. And in fact, one of the things we project is that uh, green hydrogen demand will bring lots and lots of uh, new players onto the field. Uh, uh, in our last event of this kind, we had uh, Minister Juan Carlos Jobet from Chile. That would become a new producer. Australia in the Northwest, Northern Africa, uh, and there's other places like the North Sea, Iceland, the Pacific Northwest, where their renewable resources could be very valuable in hydrogen production. Um, those new sources will be farther from demand centers. Uh, so there will have to be a way to think about shipping all of these things as we go around. Last but not least, a discussion of the policies and recommendations. This part will be very brief and this presentation will be made available to the public. Uh, the policy landscape is changing very, very quickly. Uh, in uh, the Europe and the UK, we have the Fit for 55 proposals, uh, uh, as well as country specific things associated with power tariffs, contract for differences, et cetera. In the US, uh, we have uh, $8 billion of industrial hub pr proposed for the uh, uh, infrastructure bill. And there's a set of tax provisions which are proposed uh, in the reconciliation bill. Uh, assuming those bills are enacted, uh, that will make it much easier and more uh, economically favorable to make both blue and green hydrogen in the United States. Uh, Japan and Asia are not only making investments in hydrogen production, they are also uh, purchasing low carbon hydrogen and are paying a green premium to do so. And we're seeing these policy changes come out very, very quickly indeed. Towards that end, uh, we have a set of recommendations about what to do in the next 10 years. And the first is start with a colorblind planning and analysis. Uh, don't decide in advance whether blue or green is, or bio or anything else is better for you. Do the numbers, figure it out. Uh, if in fact it works better for your markets and for your geography and for your industry, then choose whatever is the best fit. Uh, you need to understand the existing infrastructure limits in detail. You need to estimate how much it'll cost to upgrade the systems, et cetera. And we strongly encourage folks to engage local communities now. Uh, equity and justice issues are extremely important and at the forefront of this discussion, and that is a place to start. Um, in terms of building infrastructure, we're going to need infrastructure for blue systems and green systems, transmission, electrolyzers, CO2 pipelines, dedicated storage, uh, re reconstruction of ports and redesigns of ships. All of this is going to be important to manifest the benefits of low carbon hydrogen broadly. Uh, to do that, uh, we recommend a set of incentives that are focused on carbon content, the life cycle carbon footprint, including upstream emissions. Uh, on the production side, that could be tax credits or contracts for differences or other revenue enhancements. On the use side, subsidies to swap out combustion engines for hydrogen engines that would support the manufacturing of electrolyzers or capture technology, uh, et cetera. And of course, we are seeing these things move into the international arena very quickly we think the development of standards around life cycles will help facilitate trade around low carbon products, including not only low carbon hydrogen and its fuels, but uh, cargo and raw materials that are made uh, using hydrogen as a feedstock or as a fuel. Uh, I wish we had more time to discuss this, but I'm delighted that we have a panel to discuss this for us. So with that, I'll turn it back to Adam. Thank you so much for the chance to share this information. Um. Julio uh, and Alex, thank you very much for the uh, great presentations. You know, the work being done by uh, Columbia Center uh, on Global Energy Policy and the Global uh, CCS Institute is uh, both substantive and in many cases groundbreaking. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, and seeing more of the studies that I know that uh, you're working on. Uh, we, uh, 
uh, now uh, have a, uh, an opportunity uh, to uh, hear from three really terrific people. Uh, before I uh, introduce them, let me uh, just remind everybody, uh, my name is Adam Semensky. I'm the Senior Advisor to the Board of Trustees at uh, CAPSAR, King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And we've been discussing uh, zero carbon hydrogen uh, as part of a circular carbon economy. And, uh, we'll now uh, uh, do a couple of things. Uh, we'd like to give each of the panelists who I'm gonna introduce an opportunity to give uh, uh, three minutes or so of introductory remarks. And then we'll break into a um, open uh, Q&A or moderated Q&A session by me. And I've got some questions. Turns out that a few of my questions look like they're being asked by the uh, group out here in the Q&A uh, as well. So I think we'll be prepared to do that. Uh, let me introduce uh, Akhil uh, Jamal, uh, Fatima Al-Shamzi al Thura, and Camilla uh, Palladino. Uh, Akhil is the chief technologist leading the carbon management uh, research division of Saudi Aramco's R&D center in Dakran, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, he is responsible for directing uh, research in carbon capture and utilization, energy efficiency, and renewables as well. Uh, he has over 30 years of experience in sustainability-related uh, research, including hydrogen uh, production technologies. Uh, so, uh, Akhil, over to you, and then we'll go to our next two panelists after you. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, and thank you, Adam, for a kind introduction. It is uh, my pleasure to participate along with the esteemed fellow panelists uh, to discuss uh, zero carbon hydrogen in a circular carbon economy. Let me start with a brief introduction of Aramco. We are a fully integrated energy and chemicals enterprise. We manage uh, about 336 billion barrels of oil equivalent reserves. About uh, one in every eight barrels of oil produced worldwide comes uh, from uh, Saudi Aramco. So in a way, we are already a major supplier of hydrogen to the world in the form of hydrocarbons, which I believe is probably the best hydrogen carrier. However, we need to take care of carbon using a more integrated approach that leverages existing infrastructures and paves the way for a more sustainable global energy mix, leading to a net zero carbon emission future. Uh, to meet uh, ever-growing global energy demand, I believe a more comprehensive approach needs to be considered, where both uh, new and uh, traditional energy sources contribute uh, in parallel and leverage the existing infrastructure in, in, in a way that uh, reduces net carbon emission in a most cost-effective manner. Uh, to put it simply, we need to uh, close the carbon cycle to the maximum extent possible according to a circular carbon economy framework, uh, which was uh, just mentioned, uh, reduce, removed, recycle, and reuse across the energy system. And blue hydrogen is a vital and a practical pathway to, uh, to help decarbonize a global energy system under CCE framework. Hydrogen is uh, not only a, a known commodity uh, to the oil and gas industry, but it's widely used in refinery. About 120 million tons of hydrogen, as was mentioned uh, previously by Alex, is produced. About 80% of that hydrogen uh, is uh, coming from the hydrocarbon sources, oil and gas. And this hydrogen production, as predicted by International Energy Agency and Hydrogen Council by 2050 will grow by five to seven times uh, uh, under the sustainable development uh, scenario. So using the current technologies, production of hydrogen is due to capture and it's uh, long distance transportation is costly. Although, although it is still a lot more economical as was shown uh, in, the, in the slides before me compared to green hydrogen, uh, through water electrolysis, it is still uh, blue hydrogen is, is still a cheaper option. Therefore, technologies needs to be developed, keeping in mind large scale production of hydrogen that can be efficiently and cost competitively convert hydrocarbons 
to hydrogen with CCS. I will stop here and I will look forward to participate in the discussion. Akil, that was a, a, a terrific and an on-time uh, uh, description of what Aramco is doing. And I'm delighted to hear uh, more about the blue hydrogen. Uh, I think that, uh, that that is going to be an important stepping stone on the way uh, to uh, making uh, hydrogen work uh, effectively. Uh, our next uh, comments will come from uh, Fatima Alfura Al Shamsi. Uh, Fatima is the Assistant Undersecretary for Electricity and Future Energy in the United Arab Emirates, Ministry of Energy and Industry. Uh, she's uh, a futuristic and strategic thinker uh, and a leader with a long track record in senior management. Uh, she possesses a rich background ranging from electrical engineering, uh, that's the ENG that you often see in front of her name, uh, and renewables, uh, water, business development, and project management. Uh, Fatima, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for the introduction. And um, thank you, Holio and uh, Alex, for, for, for the presentation. It was very useful. Um, maybe, Adam, uh, as, as people who know me, I'm, I'm moving from one entity to another entity. So <laughs> now I, I moved to the Department of Energy in Abu Dhabi. And um, uh, just to introduce what Department of Energy in Abu Dhabi is doing, uh, we are the um, a regulator and uh, strategy setting entity in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. The Department of Energy works on developing strategic uh, initiatives uh, to diversify and secure energy sources for the economic, environmental, and the social, social sustainability of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. From here, you see that it's, it's, it's a moving from a regulatory body to, uh, to, to a regulation and uh, uh, vision and strategy setting. And that's uh, include definitely the view or the um, direction with regard to the uh, energy transition uh, uh, activity. Um, as you know, UAE is, uh, as like other GCC, most of the GCC country, we were uh, we have signed uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, I think we were uh, on the first uh, one of the first uh, countries who signed uh, those uh, this uh, agreement, and um, definitely in this agreement there is a commitment uh, to achieve net zero uh, in the after uh, twenty fifty. Um, we started uh, different activity with regard to reducing the uh, carbon emission. And um, we've been there for the uh, CCUS uh, activity to promote the utilization actually of the, of the uh, CO2. You are aware of uh, Ariada project that uh, capture uh, 800,000 ton of the uh, CO2 uh, annually. Uh, but now we are expanding to achieve uh, 5 million ton. Now going to the hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, we look to the hydrogen as very important. Uh, um, uh, as a very important source of energy to, to, to achieve the, the net zero or to reduce the emission. And um, uh, different analysis has been uh, conducted with regard to hydrogen. Um, beginning of the year, uh, we have announced Abu Dhabi uh, Hydrogen Alliance to develop the uh, strategy for the Emirate of Abu Dhabi uh, with regard to being uh, uh, a potential uh, exporter for, for the hydrogen and also to uh, define the uh, vision for the uh, hydrogen within the, the, the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. Uh, I agree with, with different uh, recommendation um, um, uh, Olio has mentioned. Um, that's, uh, of course, uh, blue hydrogen as a, as a country uh, which, which has uh, natural gas 
blue hydrogen is there, but also we have uh, plenty of uh, potential BB utilization and green hydrogen is there. We have a pilot project in Dubai is having a pilot project for the uh, green hydrogen, which has been commissioned uh, this year. And um, I can elaborate uh, maybe later. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Fatima. That's uh, just great. And we'll uh, be delighted to come back to you and, and learn more uh, in our uh, question session. Uh, Camilla Palladino uh, is the Executive Vice President uh, for Corporate Strategy and Investor uh, Relations at SNAM, one of the world's leading energy infrastructure uh, operators and among Italy's largest listed companies. Uh, with degrees from Oxford University and the London School of Economics, she actually began her career as a reporter uh, working on financial analysis, uh, but she very quickly uh, entered into the corporate energy arena and over the course of the last decade has held positions of increasing uh, responsibility uh, in uh, Italy. Uh, Camilla, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, and, and uh, thank you, Julio, for having me. This is shaping up to be a great discussion. I was very interested uh, in the findings of the paper. Um, so just to very briefly talk about SNAM and what we do. Um, we, as you were saying, Adam, we're um, an energy infrastructure company and you know, basically a gas pipeline storage and regasification um, company. And what we do, you know, what our thinking with regards to hydrogen is um, articulated on, on, in three areas. On the one hand, we look at what the world might look like, you know, scenario planning and uh, and system design, and that's because energy infrastructure, you know, you're, you're building for 50 years, uh, so having some idea of, of how things are evolving, especially when they're evolving so quickly, um, is very important. Uh, the other thing we do is we look at how to make our infrastructure and our investments hydrogen ready or, you know, future proof, as it were. Um, so, you know, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, it, it's come up in the questions as well, uh, but 70% of our pipelines, so 70% of our, of our lines are made out of materials that are today uh, hydrogen ready, ready to carry blends up to 100% hydrogen. Uh, and that's very interesting as you think about how you know, the world might evolve and you can think about how um, hydrogen will one day substitute gas demand, at least in some areas. And so you can look at how the infrastructure might evolve and it, it's it's good to have flexibility in that way. Um, in our last segment, you, we have a hydrogen business unit um, that's attempting to start to create scale in this market cause as, you know, as as we were we were discussing before, as we heard from the report, um, the key hurdle to getting hydrogen off the ground is cost um, and you know in our view we have slightly different cost estimates uh, from those presented but I think we are at the at the lower end of the scale so more optimistic in terms of hydrogen costs and we see it coming down to two dollars a kilogram uh, in the world's best re renewable resource areas where there's where there's you know, cheap solar and wind power uh, but the key to getting us there will be to scale hydrogen production up um, you know obviously the big solar plants uh, but that that's happening already uh, but also electrolyzers the key will be you know for electrolyzer plants to ramp up and electrolyzer suppliers um, the whole the whole of the value chain to ramp up and that's what's going to uh, deliver the cost reductions that we see uh, so so uh, SNAM is also working on on that angle and we leave it for, for the discussion there thank you uh Thank you very much, uh, Camilla. Uh, before we uh, uh, go into the uh, moderated discussion, uh, I just want to let everybody know that we'll be opening up the questions uh, from the audience. And I see that you, many of you have already figured out how to use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen to uh, put your uh, questions in. Uh, you know, we started uh, with uh, Julio and, uh, and Alex. And, uh, and I, Julio, I noticed that there's at least five other people that wanted to ask you the same question that I did. And that is, tell us about the Howarth and Jacobson uh, paper on uh, blue hydrogen and, and why is it that they are claiming uh, that blue hydrogen is, uh, is uh, not as uh, good even as shale gas in terms of its 
uh, carbon footprint. It doesn't seem quite right to a lot of people. And I think that uh, you have uh, some thoughts on that. Could you let us know, Julie? Julia? So thank you. Uh, let me start by saying uh, that upstream emissions are certainly a concern. Uh, natural gas leakage is a problem uh, and upstream emissions uh, certainly contribute to the greenhouse gas footprint of blue hydrogen uh, or uh, any other system that uses natural gas. Uh, the Biden administration appears to be taking that seriously. Uh, regulations are being reintroduced and reinforced uh, and industry is starting to get proactive on this. So that's positive. But to manage the issue is certainly important. Uh, uh, in order to achieve our environmental goals, to address questions of equity, et cetera, it's essential to minimize all upstream impacts. That is true for blue, green or biohydrogen. Uh, our assessments are quite, uh, assume very different initial conditions than the kind that the Howarth and Jacobson paper presented. Uh, first of all, uh, we go all the way up to 90% capture. Uh, I'm pleased to see that all of the announced recent projects are 90% capture or greater. We, they use a different technology base. Most of them are autothermal reformers, not steam methane units. Um, uh, our assumptions are less than 1% fugitive emissions. Uh, that is the industry standard today. Uh, US average is about one and a quarter percent fugitive emissions and best uh, is less than 0.2%. Um, uh, if you're going to use blue hydrogen, uh, we would uh, recommend using that kind of a framework. Those numbers match those that the International Energy Agency, the IPCC, the Pembina Institute, Resources for the Future and others have used. Uh, so we're pretty confident that our initial assumptions are accurate and more representative of both the current and future practice. Um, uh, that said, the system which we just talked about, 90% capture, less than a percent fugitive emissions, you get basically the same life cycle footprint as you would for green hydrogen with solar. Um, it is not as good, however, as green hydrogen from wind or from hydro, uh, which are slightly better. Um, so if you execute blue hydrogen with controls on upstream emissions, with high capture fractions, et cetera, a blue hydrogen not only reduces the greenhouse gas emissions substantially, but also leads to reduction in criteria pollutants as well. As we mentioned earlier, SOx, NOx, uh, volatile organic carbon and particulates. Uh, we expect we'll publish something on this uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Julio, for that uh, description. I'm sure we're going to be seeing a lot more about this over the coming weeks as mm -hmm. uh, additional peer-reviewed um, comments come out. Uh, the uh, question I wanted to ask Alex is, I know that today's topic was really uh, uh, green and blue hydrogen and how hydrogen can play a role uh, in, uh, in a circular economy, a circular carbon economy. Uh, but I know that you have uh, been jointly working on uh, three other uh, reports that have been published to date, and there may, may even be some additional ones coming soon. And I wanted to give Alex a, a chance to talk a little bit about some of those uh, already published studies and the upcoming ones, because I, I actually saw in the Q&A, uh, just as an example, uh, there was a question about CO2 recycling and reuse. And Alex, I know you've done some work on that. Could you just give us a little uh, preview of, uh, of what else has been done? Thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Adam. So, so yes, as part of this series with CGP, we've published uh, three reports so far, including the Blue Hydrogen Report. And there's another one which is in final review at the moment. Um, uh, we published one on technology readiness and costs of carbon capture and storage. And what that report does is it describes the current state of mainly capture, transport and storage technologies. And, and spoiler alert, they're all at TRL9, which means they're fully commercial. You can buy them off the shelf. Not surprising considering CCS has been uh, commercially deployed for 50 years next year. Next year it turns 50 years old. Um, but it also explores the cost drivers of CCS. So what are the cost drivers uh, for capture and for transport? Uh, they have quite different cost drivers and, and, and in, in summary, uh, the more pure your CO2 is, the higher the cost of capture. Uh, and for transport, it's all about scale. You want big pipelines produce uh, transporting at least, at least 5 million tons per year 
uh, in order to benefit from the economies of scale, that brings costs down very significantly. But I guess one of the key messages from that report is that is that CCS is mature, it's available off the shelf, and it, it, it's been around for 50 years, so that shouldn't be a surprise. Um, and it, 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 uh, it's actually uh, not expensive. Um, it has a range of costs. It depends upon the application. So uh, the question, how much does CCS cost? The answer is, it depends on where you apply it. Um, and one of the other reports that we produced uh, and, and published as part of this series uh, is a, a report that looks at the policy and legal um, uh, uh, issues that arise if you want to deploy carbon capture and storage. So it makes a series of recommendations about uh, the sorts of policy levers that governments can pull uh, to really incentivize private investment in carbon capture and storage, um, which is necessary to play a, a significant role in, 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 the, in a future cir circular carbon economy as we approach as we approach net zero. And those recommendations are not just uh, provide subsidies. They're things like ensure regulation is clear and, and, uh, and, and uh, in place. It's, it, it's about uh, providing perhaps um, uh, concessional finance for CCS projects. It's also about uh, doing the math, right? Uh, governments are understanding what their best pathway to net zero is. That'll, that'll include all, uh, all parts of the circular carbon economy very clearly stating this is the role for CCS, sending those signals to industry, and then putting in place policies that allow industry to, to bring their expertise and their, and their uh, uh, significant resources to bear on the problem. Um, I'll, I'll actually pass to Julio to talk briefly about another report that CEGP has produced on recycling, uh, which has been produced quite, uh, quite recently. Julio, do you want to quickly talk to the recycling report? Yes, thank you, and uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, we did publish a report recently on CO2 recycling. Uh, I'm gonna put that here uh, in the chat function for the attendees as well. Um, and we really look at the same sort of thing, current costs, future costs, infrastructure needs. Uh, I encourage everybody to take a look. Uh, Julio, and I did hear you say earlier, uh, one of the other questions that uh, came from uh, our uh, attendees today was, would the slides in, in the presentation today be made available? And I think you said that they will indeed be uh, posted on the uh, CGEP uh, website. Uh, yes, uh, they will be made available uh, as will uh, the recording of this event. Great, that's uh, fantastic. And uh, thank you for putting the link up for everybody uh, as well. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask uh, Akil uh, if he could just give us a, a flavor of some of the other uh, technologies that Aramco, Saudi Aramco, has been working on uh, in this carbon space. Uh, Akil, I know, uh, for example, uh, there, uh, last year there was uh, some discussion uh, about direct air capture uh, as a project at Aramco, and I thought maybe you could just uh, uh, tell us what other things we might look forward to in, in terms of yeah. opportunities. So um, thank you, Adam, for the question. In Saudi Aramco, we are uh, looking at a number of different technologies in the both hydrogen and carbon capture space. Uh, particularly, our focus is on the uh, membrane, uh, palladium membrane uh, based uh, and these, uh, these electric uh, ceramic uh, membrane based uh, reactor systems. What it does, it uh, it is a process intensification. So you could potentially use liquid hydrocarbon as well as the gaseous hydrocarbon in these membrane reactors. And you could uh, produce uh, pure purified hydrogen that is uh, 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 what you call, uh, has the right specification for the mobility application and power generation application. But at the same time, you capture the CO2 uh, so what these the membrane reactor does is not only reduces as a, a, a compact footprint, but also it's a more energy efficient and the, the penalty associated with carbon capture is, uh, is rather uh, uh, much smaller compared to the conventional system. We are for the large scale hydrogen uh, systems, we are looking at, uh, because uh, today's uh, steam methane reformers are optimized for hydrogen production, without CO2 capture. But if you're looking at large scale hydrogen production to supply hydrogen to demand centers like Japan, Korea, or China, then you have to uh, think in a more holistic way where the whole value chain is uh, considered. 
in, uh, and taken into account. So uh, autothermal reforming is uh, is one of the area that we are looking at and autothermal reform, reforming in conjunction with the membrane systems uh, that we are developing. Uh, we are also looking at uh, in a more longer term on electrified reforming. The advantage for electrified reforming, it's not only allows you to capture almost 100% of CO2, but it, uh, it, you could potentially make a hybrid system where your electricity coming from the renewable sources. Uh, we are very proud of the work that we are doing also on the uh, carbon capture. So we have developed a metal organic framework uh, uh, with a uh, professor here at uh, King uh, Saud University of uh, King, um, uh, what do you call, uh, um, Kaust, uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology where we are uh, developing metal organic framework and we have uh, uh, been now developing a one ton per day carbon capture system for NGCC natural gas combined cycle type of power plant but the same material that we are developing could potentially be used for uh, direct air capture systems and uh, we are uh, basically using these metal organic framework in a uh, fiber sorbent application there is a, a paper recently uh, going to be published actually it's already published on the net in the jax uh, where we are using metal organic framework encapsulated with these fiber sorbents so that again you can make these compact uh, direct air capture systems um, I, I look uh, in other technologies uh, we are exploring mm -hmm. uh, carbon uh, hydrocarbon pyrolysis. Uh, also, even uh, we are talking to some of the these startup companies uh, where they are looking at the underground hydro, uh, hydrogen production where the carbon dioxide is sequestered at the same time hydrogen is produced. It is a larger, cha a rather challenging uh, uh, concept, but uh, if it is uh, doable, it, it's going to be a, a very, very cheap uh, source of uh, a blue hydrogen production uh, in the future. I think I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kiel. I know that uh, Saudi Ramco has actually been one of the leading technology uh, companies in the energy uh, area. I wanted to ask, uh, uh, and by the way, I, I hear that uh, that there's some work underway in carbon cured concrete that's taking place at Cal. Yes, uh, absolutely. In uh, fact, uh, right. <laughs> we, <laughs> we are, uh, we are working with a local uh, uh, cement uh, precast uh, cement uh, company here uh, called Al Kifa, where we have, we have just demonstrated uh, the carbon cured precast concrete in a in a large scale uh, blocks. So right. uh, actually, very very imp uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, what called uh, forward looking work where you could potentially sequester uh -huh. up to 20% of CO2 in the concrete cement. That'd be great. You know, I wanted to move on to Fatima. Uh, Fatima, just when I hear this conversation, I think a lot of people don't realize that there is a big uh, carbon uh, capture and storage project in Abu Dhabi at the steel plant uh, that uh, you mentioned the net zero activities that uh, Abu Dhabi and the United Arab Emirates has been involved in. Uh, it seems to me that that it's not fully appreciated how significant the activities uh, are in the GCC region uh, in terms of, of truly uh, investing uh, significantly in projects associated with carbon management and moving towards net zero. Could you just give us your impressions of, of uh, of things that are happening in the GCC region along these lines and, and uh, why it's important on a global scale. Thank you. You're on mute, Fatima. Okay. Actually, as, uh, as I mentioned, um, maybe because we are uh, uh, known to be uh, a hydrocarbon economy region, so people is having the idea that uh, Maybe we are not considering the climate change, but as I mentioned, most of the GCC country has signed 
the Paris Agreement in the, in the first day. So uh, there is there is many activity activity going on either to of course um, transit or the transition of power system from uh, fossil dependence to the uh, to, to renewable and clean energy, and that include the nuclear because I think this is a good idea compared to producing hydrogen and then transfer it to uh, power. This is from the power side, but from other implementation and uh, capturing the, uh, the CO2, uh, definitely we have, I think in 2018, uh, a Riyadh project, which is uh, actually capturing um, 800,000 ton a year from the steel factory uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and the utilization, uh, utilized in, in injection to the uh, oil will in, in Adnuk. Uh, and it seems that, or as, as looking to the business case, it has been proven that this is a good uh, business opportunity. It's not only uh, environmental, but it proved to uh, the intention environmental, but it's proved that even it's, a, it's an economic uh, solution. Um, Adnok has announced last year the expansion of this plant and um, oh, by 2030, 5 million tons will be uh, captured and of course utilized in, in different uh, sites for, for Adnok. Uh, we believe that um, also the, the responsibility and the potential uh, hydrogen activity is uh, in, in the new way and in, in, in the region, you, we heard uh, Khaled, uh, I believe, uh, highlighting the activity in Saudi Arabia. But it's not only UAE and Saudi, it's also Oman. Oman recently announced their hydrogen uh, alliance will do the different necessary um, analysis to, to, to develop uh, Oman uh, idea. From our side also, we are uh, in, in UAE, and in Abu Dhabi, we are working how to make uh, Abu Dhabi fit for hydrogen and how to um, also utilize the, the, the opportunity of, of, of also uh, availability of the uh, sunlight and the possibility of utilizing the solar BB for green hydrogen generation. Um, as I mentioned, Abu Dhabi uh, Hydrogen Alliance has been announced beginning of the year and um, that include government and in uh, different uh, business and industrial uh, party to, 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 to study uh, what is the best uh, way for, for the UAE and for, and for Abu Dhabi specific with regard uh, to, to hydrogen. Definitely, uh, if we look to Abu Dhabi market, uh, we are uh, conducting um, uh, different uh, or analyzing different scenarios for reducing further reducing of the emission. Uh, different scenarios is there, including uh, possible scenario to meet uh, Paris Agreement, and that that will uh, that is considering the utilization different option with utilization with CCS, CCUS, hydrogen. Um, we decided that, as as uh, as Julio mentioned, to be blind into hydrogen. So our analysis will start, and we are looking to to promote the market of the hydrogen. We need to start and to promote the infrastructure. We need to start with what is uh, available and what is uh, uh, cost uh, preferable, uh, and then it will be easy to 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 to, to move. But um, both blue and green hydrogen are there in our analysis. Uh, thank you, uh, Fatima. Um, Camilla, this, this actually leads perfectly into the question that I wanted to ask you. I think that uh, what uh, Fatima has been saying and what we heard from Khalid al belief and the, and the serious uh, effort that's being made in this region uh, to uh, uh, advance carbon management technologies uh, that, that I've heard people say, well, gee, it seems like greenwashing, it, it, but it, it doesn't. I mean, when you hear Fatima talk about what's happening uh, in 
the UAE. It's real. There are real activities in Saudi Arabia. Um, how are the companies uh, like Sanam and others uh, that you're familiar with in Italy dealing with this question of are the things that you're doing real or is it or is it is it fall into, you know, I don't think it does fall into greenwashing, but I think that this is a question that often comes up. I wanted to give you a chance to address that. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, so I think for us, you know, we're an infrastructure company rather than an upstreamer or, um, you know, a consumer uh, facing company. Uh, so, so, you know, we transport, store uh, natural gas at the moment. Uh, but the good thing for us is that, you know, uh, as, to, to borrow a phrase from Julio, the infrastructure is sort of blind to what it carries, right? Um, the infrastructure can, you know, our, we're, we're, you know, we're we're in a in a very good position at the moment because hydrogen is going to be so important, you know. And I think there's wide consensus uh, that we're looking at, you know, hydrogen hydrogen taking up a big proportion of our. Uh, energy needs in a net zero world. And because we need to get costs down um, and the ingredients of getting costs down are accessing the best renewable resource, uh, they're doing so at scale and they're having, you know, relatively contained transport and delivery costs. Uh, and if you think about that, then a sort of an infrastructure company like ours is, is you know, very well placed. So, you know, if you think about Europe, the very best you know, solar resources, you know, we're in the south of Europe, so the very best solar resources you'll find in southern Italy uh, and, and, you know, northern Africa. Um, and, and, you know, we can we can help access these through our existing pipeline network that, that you know, that there's pipeline connections already between North Africa and Italy as well, and then the Italian backbone. Um, which is us. Uh, and then, you know, if you think that that hydrogen needs to scale up, a pipeline network can can help break the chicken and egg situation that, you know, that, that many people talk about with hydrogen, uh, because you can help connect potential supply with potential demand. Um, and it's worth noting that the hydrogen network, you, you can use blended um, hydrogen methane mixes, uh, you know, without having to change anything at all. Uh, up to certain blends. So that's a good way to get some demand going and some scale going. And if you want to go 100%, then the network has double and sometimes triple parallel pipes. And you can start to see how, you know, valleys could emerge. Um, and the third thing that's worth mentioning is that if you if you think that hydrogen production consumption will, will be scaled up, then the cost of transport really is quite contained. Uh, we are in a group of transport system operators in Europe. There's 23 of us. Um, and the study basically says that you can transport um, hydrogen in Europe in the future in sort of existing gas grids refurbished and retrofitted. You can transport it for between 10 and 20 euro cents per thousand kilometers per kilo. Um, and, you know, if we're talking about hydrogen costing, you know, $4, $6, we're, we're hoping to get to $2, um, then, you know, 10 to 20 euro cents um is per kilo per thousand kilometers you, you can see how it's worth going to the air you worth transporting hydrogen from where it's cheap to produce uh to where it's going to be consumed so so you know i i i think we're in a, we're in a particularly good place where where hydrogen's concerned i hope uh, that answers the question yeah that that did indeed uh camilla and i'm i i think that uh what i'm taking away from this discussion is that uh, it's not going to be easy, but projects are underway and uh, we'll learn from these and probably drive the cost down and, uh, and be able to make the progress towards a goal that I think everybody supports of uh, finding ways to, uh, to uh, meet the uh, goals of the uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, Julio, I want to uh, we're going to run out of uh, time, Julio, in about 10 minutes. And there were a number of questions that were addressed to you. And I, I actually noticed that were several that you said you wanted to answer live. Do you just want to jump in, Julio, and, and, uh, and go ahead and do that? <laughs> sure. So uh, I answered some of those with the question that you asked me. So uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that we've got some of that out of the way. But there was a one question to ask about what uh, companies are doing more broadly uh, and that follows Camillo's points quite nicely. Uh, let me start by saying that they are doing the obvious thing. They're starting where the resource is best, uh, just like SNAM is, uh, and just like uh, Adnoc and Aramco is doing. 
And so uh, we're seeing large green and blue hydrogen projects emerging where the resource is cheapest and best. Uh, a, a good example of this is an enormous new uh, green, a blue hydrogen project in Alberta, uh, which is 90% uh, capture ATR, uh, low upstream emissions. Uh, that's being done by Air Products. Air Products is also doing uh, this enormous project at NEOM that uh, Dr. Akhil had mentioned earlier, uh, uh, five gigawatts of renewable solar. And there you have high capacity factor and high wind. Uh, you're seeing uh, mining companies and energy companies uh, and fuel companies all moving to Chile and starting to build projects in the Atacama Desert, again, because that's where the resource is good. Um, uh, and you're starting to see uh, the same thing happening in Northern Europe with offshore wind. I, one particular project I wanted to pull out is the hybrid project that's being done in Sweden, uh, where they're using low cost uh, hydro and nuclear power to generate hydrogen for steel production. And they just sent their first shipment of steel there. SSAB, the Swedish steel company is driving that. And we're seeing similar things happening in the rest of Europe uh, with companies like Tata, uh, ArcelorMittal, uh, even US Steel is starting to look at ways to use blue and green hydrogen in their businesses. Uh, uh, last but not least, Maersk as a company is buying low carbon fuels. They announced recently that they're buying ships and fuels for low carbon methanol. Uh, that can be made from low carbon hydrogen. Uh, but we expect that they will increasingly move towards ammonia uh, as the IMO sort of puts its standards together. So we're seeing a lot of corporate activity on both the supply side and the demand side. And that's very, very welcome. Uh, thank you for that explanation, um, Julio. Yeah, I think that there are uh, uh, projects underway in many countries. And I, I think that the regulatory frameworks and and financial arrangements associated with these uh, will also require a lot of attention. Um, carbon storage uh, would definitely benefit from uh, having government supplied insurance, for example, uh, in the same way that I think we developed the nuclear power industry. Uh, that might be something that, uh, that would fall under your policy and regulations uh, discussion. Uh, there was a question, uh, um, Alex, about the affordability of all of these things, uh, you know, or maybe I could just direct it at whoever wants to put their hand up in the panel. Are consumers going to be able to afford uh, these new technologies, and and how can we uh, how can we address the issue that uh, Julio brought up uh, on uh, fairness and equity associated with uh, carbon management? That's a very big question. Um, <laughs> an extreme. Do you want to punt it to Julio? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess I'll make some initial remarks and then I'll, I'll punt it to Julio and others on the panel. Um, you know, th there have been many studies done which show the cost that clean hydrogen needs to be reduced to in order to be equivalent to, say, fuel for for, for vehicles. Right. And and it needs to come down a fair way in order to uh, present to the consumer the same price for the final the final service if you're using the same energy conversion technology to derive that service, for example. But I think what we're going to see is the cost of production and the cost of utilization of hydrogen also uh, will continue to, to reduce uh, as, as the market grows, as, as more projects are developed, as, as economies of scale, as the power of, of, of competition between vendors starts to come into play. So yes, it's more expensive today, um, uh, but I'm very confident that the, that cost will steadily come down to a point where in the not too distant future, uh, the, the cost premium for the use of hydrogen in some of these applications will be relatively low and consumers will absolutely be prepared to pay. I, yeah, I think that uh, in fact, an, another question came up about uh, cost to consumers. I mean, I, I think that it's only fair to assume that uh, other technologies might be able to benefit from the uh, scale and demonstration that we saw occur with uh, solar and wind. And I would expect to see something like that happen in the hydrogen area. Uh, electrolyzers can be improved. There's a lot of work that's, that's being done uh, in that area. Uh, and even in, uh, it's, it's not part of today's discussion, but battery technology, I think, uh, has not really advanced very much, but I think a lot more uh, 
activity is now taking place uh, in this area, and it's something that I think ultimately uh, would help to drive the overall cost down. Um, you know, even uh, uh, in uh, in the space of of renewables, uh, including uh, hydrogen. So uh, one of the one of the Adam, if I may uh, add please. this discussion, I think one of the key, key thing in terms of bringing the cost down, especially in the beginning of the hydrogen uh, activity, is to utilize the existing infrastructure. And some of the ways uh, that we find from our analysis is that uh, because hydrocarbons, uh, you know, are a good source uh, of uh, energy and can uh, contain uh, up to 25, from 15 to 25 percent of hydrogen, they could potentially be carried in a dual uh, hydrogen, uh, sort of hydrocarbon CO2 carriers. So for example, you could carry LPG long distances and produce hydrogen in market using existing infrastructure, capture the CO2, bring back the CO2 in the same LPG carriers back to where uh, the hydrocarbons originated. So there, there are all some uh, other places where you could potentially sequester or store the carbon. And I think uh, that way you could potentially reduce uh, the transportation of hydrogen uh, uh, significantly. Right, you know, uh, Akil, you're reminding me that the Saudi Aramco, um, uh, Japan, uh, blue hydrogen ammonia uh, project that at the, at the end, uh, the Japanese decided that they could direct burn along with coal, uh, up to 20% yes. of the BTU value uh, in ammonia. And what they found was they lowered things like particulate emissions and normal, you know, other uh, kinds of, of emissions. And they did not significantly change uh, the nitrogen oxide uh, emissions. And so I, th I think that learning by doing is, is ultimately going to uh, help drive this. Uh, we're gonna we're getting very close to the end. I, the, one of the other questions, uh, Julio, that came up, and I think again, somebody asked, uh, will the will there be the text of these uh, questions and answers uh, being provided? I'm not sure about that, but this whole session is being recorded, and you can listen to it again uh, to pick up on those things. and uh, And the links to the studies are being made available, uh, and and uh, so on. Uh, I. I'm going to try to end this uh, on time. I wish we had more time for Q&A, uh, uh, but uh, I'm going to uh, take my cue from, uh, from Hadia and uh, Julio. I want to thank our speakers uh, for uh, joining us today. Uh, we uh, started with, uh, with uh, Holodal Belief, uh, Julio Friedman, uh, and uh, Alex uh, Zapantis. Uh, we had great uh, uh, presentations from Akil Jamal, uh, Fatima uh, Al Shamsi, and uh, uh, Camilla uh, Palladino. And I really appreciate uh, the tremendous uh, presentations that everybody made. Uh, as mentioned, the full video recording will be available on the Center uh, on Global Energy Policy uh, website in a few days. Uh, the CGEP public events series will continue uh, into the next month uh, as uh, the uh, Columbia University uh, semester uh, begins. And for a full calendar of the upcoming events, please visit the CGEP online uh, site. And there'll be a link uh, uh, on that uh, that I think is may have already been put up. And if it's not being put up, uh, uh, we'll uh, do that before we say goodbye. Uh, you could certainly find it by just simply typing CGEP Columbia University into a web browser and you'll find everything that you need. Uh, on behalf uh, of everybody uh, on the call here today, I'd like to thank our audience for the great questions that they asked. I'd like to thank our speakers. And I hope that everybody enjoys the rest of the day wherever or evening, <laughs> wherever you are. Uh, we look forward 
uh, to uh, seeing you uh, soon and, uh, and stay tuned uh, for uh, further uh, great uh, webinars uh, from uh, the Global uh, CCS Institute and the Columbia University uh, Center on Global Energy Policy. Thank you very much, everybody, and good night. Thank you. Thank you.